Hi, I'm François Pogam, and I will present to you uh, the writing scripts in Python module for the Branagh School. So first, I want to start by explaining the origin of this uh, module, so why this module exists. Uh, it comes from the fact that we realized that some students in the school, uh, they learned to code in Python through Jupyter Notebooks, which is a great thing, and Jupyter Notebooks are super useful tools. But maybe uh, if they get just too comfortable using notebooks and not uh, writing actual scripts, uh, it will uh, hinder their ability to just uh, expand their projects outside of notebooks because uh, Jupyter notebooks are super useful, but for certain aspects, uh, it's just not enough when your project starts to grow and become a bit more complex. I'll start with the outline of the presentation because we'll uh, do first a presentation and then a uh, hands-on part with an, uh, an exercise where we'll uh, write a script together. And I'll show you uh, yeah, the basics of how to write scripts and import functions from my script to the other. Uh, so first, uh, I'll talk about the problem with uh, notebooks. So as I said, they are like super useful tools, but not perfect. So I will try to convince you that the skill of uh, writing scripts is very necessary uh, if you want to uh, be proficient with Python. And also notebooks, uh, notebooks uh, are, remain a very useful tools. You shouldn't always use uh, notebooks. Then I'll show you two um, aspects of uh, or elements of scripts that don't exist in notebooks, but that are quite useful and important to understand. Uh, so yeah, this module is mainly aimed at people who already are familiar with Python, although it will be uh, basic code. It's especially aimed at people who already have experience with uh, notebooks, but uh, want to have an easier time to transfer their notebooks into uh, scripts that they can run. So this uh, presentation is uh, very much inspired from a presentation done by Joel Gruss on JupyterCon 2018. So I uh, stole shamele shamelessly stole some slides from him. And actually I was inspired by uh, Greg Keir who made the first version of this module, and I just uh, yeah uh, stole the idea of, of using this presentation uh, from him. First, I want to reiterate that uh, notebooks are great, uh, and especially if you want to have an interactive part or interactive aspect with your code. Because as you might know, um, Jupyter notebooks are a way to execute uh, Python code, but cells by cell, cell by cell, so like uh, snippet by snippet of code. So you can easily uh, just partially run your code, inspect the variables and everything that you've uh, generated through this code and then continue. So if you have a pipeline with multiple steps, it's easy to check in between of each steps that everything is going well. So it's very good for interactive coding and fast prototyping. It's also great for visualization because uh, you can integrate uh, plots in the notebook, so you can have your code and the plots in the same place, and you can interact with the plot and modify it uh, as you go along. So it, it's great for that, and it can it can make for easy debugging. So as I said, since you have access to the state of your notebook, like it's a persistent state, so all of the variables that are declared in the notebook stay in the memory as long as the notebook is alive. So it's easy uh, if you have a pipeline and different variables that are created, you can, as you go along, check the values and shape of all your variables. Uh, so here are examples to illustrate the fact that visualization is very cool uh, in notebooks. And I think especially uh, interesting for us uh, working with uh, brain imaging data because we have uh, highly complex data uh, that is hard to just uh, represent in static two dimensions. So it's a real plus to be able to like uh, interactively uh, scroll between different slides or like have a 3D object that you can move around and change like the views and etc. 
So yeah, again, it's a very great tool for those situations. But on the, on the other hand, uh, Jupyter notebooks can be evil. Uh, first point is that they're hard to share, deploy, and reproduce uh, because it's a self-contained file with everything. Uh, it's hard to deploy because you cannot. It's hard to extract the code from it to use it in another script or in another uh, environment or uh, anything like that. It's hard to share because uh, there is no proper dependency management uh, in the notebook ecosystem. And it can hinder reproducibility because it's hard to, to do code versioning uh, with notebooks. Um, because with scripts, you can more easily track which change you made for each, uh, at, for each script at each, which time with git commits and everything. But um, doing it with notebooks, it's not impossible, but you have the layer of the notebook on top of it which makes it just a, a pain. Uh, it's hard to re reliably test. Uh, you can do that, but it, it, yeah, it's just, it requires way more work to write proper unit tests for functions you define in notebooks and run them consistently. Um, and the easy debugging, last point is that the easy debugging can become a, a nightmare quite qu quickly uh, because the same reason that makes it easy can just make it uh, infinitely more complex. And I'll show you an example, and that's related to the persistent state of your notebook. So here is a very dumb example, but for example, here we define a function which adds just two to your input. So X and it returns X plus two. So, okay, you define a variable Y, that just the function applied to two, so two plus two, it should be four. But then, when, but then when you check for does y equals 4, it returns false. And if you print y, it's actually 5. So there's a problem here because 2 plus 2 should be 4 and the computer shouldn't make such a gross mistake. But actually, if you look closely, you can see that those numbers here, uh, which for those who are not very much acquainted to notebooks, represent the order in which uh, each cells were um, executed, you see that this cell was executed before this one. So actually, when this cell was executed, there is no guarantee that the function was actually x plus 2. Maybe it was overwritten in this uh, cell, and maybe before it was x plus 3, but then you change it without re-running uh, that. So then your y corresponds to the old version of the f function. So that's why your variables can correspond to code that no longer exists in your notebook. And it's very hard for you cognitively when you just read your code to understand what's going on and what happened. And yeah, you don't if you don't have a memory of everything you wrote and everything in the order of everything in the order in which everything was executed it can be very hard for you to just understand what's going on. And here it's made obvious because like it's an obvious function, but when you have multiple functions that are complex, where the output is not maybe not that uh, obvious, uh, it can happen very fast that your variables uh, don't correspond to the new functions. And uh, for example, an example, a situation that happened a lot to me is that I would, um, have one variable that's with the old version of the function, but then I update the function and I rerun it, but I change the name of the variable at some place. So instead of y, y it would be like, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, z. But then some parts, some other cells, I didn't think to update them. And instead of using z, I still use y. So y still exists, but it's with the old value and the z value exists also, but it's not the same one. So you have like a mismatch, but the code runs fine because both values exist, both variables exist, but they don't correspond to what you have in mind. So it's a very, it can be very hard very quickly. And another example to show you that uh, yeah, there is not just this one, but like it can happen in many different ways 
is that here you see like the order like it's increasing in order so it's actually run in the proper order but we are missing the second one so between one and three something happened but we don't know why because the cell doesn't exist anymore so it, it means that the user created a new cell with some code run it but then you don't know the what happened in between so your variable can be related to some code that doesn't exist anymore so for debugging it it's very very tricky okay um, so yeah so uh, using notebooks it's a bit of a, of a dilemma between actually being super helpful for iterative development and interactive stuff and visualization but also creating more risks to have very dangerous situations where you don't understand what's going on because well you're uh, interacting with some code that's been updated or that doesn't exist anymore so it's not a wrong choice to use notebooks but you should be a bit careful uh, about when you want to use it okay so to summarize uh, this first uh, part I would say that if you don't need interaction with your code or if you don't need like fancy visualization then using a script is probably a good idea and it's probably a better idea than a notebook but again it's no uh, not a hard rule and it's just a case by case uh, situation but in any in any case being able to work with both notebooks and scripts is better than being comfortable only with uh, notebooks okay so now the first element that's specific to scripts is the argument parser so uh, the purpose of an argument parser it's not very obvious from the name but it's to, to be able to provide input or uh, parameters what are called arguments to your script because let's say we are in a situation where we have one very simple function which is called do stuff we take which takes two arguments and like returns p um, the first argument plus 10 times the second argument okay and you want we want to evaluate this uh, function for two specific parameters 12 and 13. in a notebook we can just write a function define our parameters with uh, just variables and then execute it and it will give us the answer and it's quite simple okay then if we want to use a script so here in this first uh, rectangle it's the content of the file so a python file is just text file with the code written inside so in this file we define the function but we have also some other code I will describe uh, a bit later, but we have the also the same element, which is uh, applying this function to our two arguments and printing it. So yeah, this is the definition of the function is the same as here. And this corresponds to this line in the notebook. But so instead of just defining the, the parameters here, we could have just like said, oh yeah, param one equals 12, param two equals 13 and do stuff, print do stuff of param1 and param2 and it would have been fine and run but uh, in practice you don't want to do that you don't want to hard code so to write uh, in plain text the values of your parameters in your script the, re the reason of that is that parameters by nature are things that you want to change eventually so let's say this function you, you want to Today you want to check it for 12 and 13, maybe, but maybe tomorrow you want to check for other values. So in the notebooks, it's easy. Since I have to interact with a notebook, I can just like update this cell and just rerun it. But with a script, it's not uh, very efficient if you have to uh, edit your script each time you want to change your parameters. Um, the reason for that is because you're likely to be using a version control uh, software so for example git that tracks the changes made to your code and then you will introduce changes 
that are not very interesting because it's just changing parameters and not changing the actual functions and the functionality of the code. So when you track the changes and the updates of your code, you just want to track the changes in what how the functions are implemented. But if you just write here, so yeah, you, you each time you change parameters, you will have to update, to push your code, etc. So you will introduce extra extra tracking that you don't want to, to, to use. So instead, what you want to do is when you run your script, you want to pass on your parameters as arguments to the script. So the way to run Python file, so for example here, this file is called myscript.py, in my terminal, I just type Python space the path to my script. So here, my script.py. But if you want to be able to add values to arguments, so here I had 12 as p1 and 13 as p2 and give me the answer. And the way for the script in the inside to recognize that this value corresponds to an argument that's called p1 and this value is correspond to an argument that's called p2 is to use an argument parser. So that's why here there is an import of the argparse uh, library. That's a default library that's shipped with Python, so you don't have to pip install it. And you'll use this library to create a parser, so it's an argument parser object that you'll call parser. And then there are methods to add arguments to our parser. So we'll say, oh yeah, if the person, like after the name of the script writes p1, it means that the following things will be the p1 argument. Uh, its type will be an integer, so you will interpret, because it's just, it's like text you type on your uh, terminal, so by default it would be a string, but you will say, oh, actually interpret that as an integer. And the help message, the help is just a message you would uh, show if a user would, would type Python my script dash dash help to just see like, oh yeah, what are the arguments of this script? It's just a description of, oh, what it is. So here it's not very descriptive because it just says param1 because it's a fake example where it doesn't correspond to anything. But yeah, it's just always useful to have descriptions of what's going on. And the same with p2. So yeah, it says, oh yeah, when the user uh, types dash p2, after what will be uh, written will be an integer and it will be p2. Then you uh, gather the arguments with the parser.parseArgs command. So you put that in the variable code args. And then we can do stuff on args.p1 because it was dash p1. It will automatically remove the dash and just call it p1. And then the same for p2. So then our code is static. We don't have to update it anymore if the function is correct. And we can call it like with 12 and 13 or 14 or whatever values. So yeah, it's, it's a way to give inputs with our, our script and it's a way to minimally interact with our script because notebook are interactive by nature, but here scripts are static and we want them to stay as static as we want because we don't want to introduce updates that are not related to implementation updates. Um, but we want to be able to interact with the script. So the minimal way to interact is to provide inputs or arguments to the script. Okay, so that was the description of the argument parser. And now the second element I want to describe if the if name equals equals main line. So it's a line you will see uh, when you begin to, to, to work with uh, scripts. And for beginners, it's a very confusing line because it's very hard to know what it does, what does it correspond to, what is the name, why is it main, and okay. And actually, it's a concept that's a very fairly common concept in uh, programming and that exists in, I guess, all programming languages or maybe not all because some weird one exists, but in all major programming languages. And it's a concept of having a section of code that's executed only if the script that it's in is the main script that it is being called, is the script that the user is actually calling right now. And so it's just that, so this meme over here is to uh, underline the fact that in other programming languages, it's maybe more intuitive way of expressing this concept because you define, a, a, usually you define a function that's called main and that will be, and you know that, oh yeah, when you call the script, 
So if there is a function called main in the script, it will be the function that will be uh, called. So you have like different ways of calling this function in different languages, but Python is a weird one where it's actually not a function that you define, it's an if statement and it has a very, looking very weird with the double underscore and everything. So yeah, here uh, Python is a weird one, like implementing this concept uh, on its own way and everybody's uh, disappointed on about the Python weirdness. Uh, so yeah, maybe it's a bit hard to grab like, oh yeah, but what's the main script? What's, what's, why would you want to do that? Uh, but I'll clarify this with a very simple example, uh, and I'll do it uh, right away. So here I'm in uh, my terminal and I will first create uh, a first, uh, Python file. So I'm going to use Vim, which is a text editor that works in the terminal. So I don't have to switch between uh, different windows. So let's call that script one, that py. So now it's, it's an empty file with empty lines, but I will just uh, define a function. Uh, let's say, do some work. Yeah, and it will take an argument, an argument called arg. Okay, and it will print working on and the argument. Okay, so I define this function. And now in this script, I want to use this, that function on an argument. So I, I, I'll do the thing I said not to do earlier, but just for the sake of simplicity, I will just hard code the argument in the script. So let's say arg equals argument one, and I call do some work of arg. Okay, so I save the file. Okay, so now you see if I do ls in my directory, there is this, the, the file here. And if I want to execute it, I just type Python script one. Okay, and it's correctly prints working on argument one. Okay, for now, everything's going well. But now I want to do, uh, write a second script uh, that will import the functions from the first one. So I will create script two and I'll say from script one, import do some work. So here it says, look at the file script one and import the object do some work that defined inside this, this, this uh, script, which is a function. So I will be able to use it here. And now what I want to do is say, uh, argument equals argument two. And let's say, oh yeah, and in, th in that file, I want to use this function only on that argument. Okay, so I save it. And now I'm gonna run it. And what we would expect, what we would want is it just printing working on argument one, uh, argument two. But if I run it, you see it's working on argument one and then working on argument two. So there's a problem here because what I intended to do is just when I run the script two, working on argument two. And what's happening is that when it's importing uh, the function from the script one, To be able to import this function and to know it exists, it has to like read the file. And as it's reading it, it's also executing what's inside. So yeah, if you're in a situation where you want this script to do stuff when you call it on its own, but not when you import from it, 
that's where the if name equals equals main is useful. So that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to add if name equals equals main. Of course, I have to indent so that uh, because it's an if statement. So for it to be in the if statement, I have to like indent and put your shit back. So now, in any case, every time the computer goes through this file, the definition of the function will be executed, but the rest will be done only if it's the main script, which means if it's a script that you're calling with the Python command. So I save that. So if I do Python script two, now I'm just working on argument two. And if I do Python script one, it's still working on argument one. And now uh, we are going to go and uh, move to the exercise part uh, of the module. So yeah, see you in the exercise part. OK, so let's go with the exercise. And for the exercise, we'll implement a visionary cipher, which is a way to encrypt and decrypt messages using a key. And so to the question, why are we doing that? It's because I like ciphers, and I'm the one making the exercise, so I decide. And also, uh, first, it's we need simple functions. And you'll see that the implementation is actually quite simple. And we, we need functions for which we can easily check if it's working or not. And with Cypher, it's, a, it's easy because if you have a mes uh, an encrypted message and a key, and you try to get decrypt it, and you have garbage nonsense uh, messages, and you know your decryption is, or your encryption uh, has a problem. So yeah, it's uh, good for that. And as you see, it's a bit simple. So we want to encrypt a message uh, with a key. So the first thing to do will associate for each letter of our message, a letter from the key. So actually here, the message is the word message and the key is the word key. So we want to encrypt this word with this word. So we'll associate each letter of the key to one letter of the message. And for the rest, because the message is longer than the key, for the remaining letters, we'll just repeat the key again and again. So uh, yeah, it makes for that. So we have message M, K, E, E, S, Y, S, K, A, E, G, Y, A, uh, E, K. So that's the association of the letters. And so with one letter of the message and one letter of the key, what we'll do is we'll, we'll add the index of the letter in the alphabet to the index of the key letter of the alphabet, and we'll associate the letter with index at the sum of both. So for example, here we have M, which is the 30th uh, letter of the alphabet. K is the 11th. So 13 plus 11 is 24, and the 24th letter in the alphabet is X. So the encrypt encrypted letter for M with the K is X. And we'll repeat that. So E is the fifth letter. So 5 plus 5 equals 10. 10 is the uh, 10th letter is J. And if we're, we're in a situation where we go above 26, so for example, S plus Y, it's 19 plus 25, it's equal to 44. And of course, we don't have 44 letters in the alphabet, or at least in the Roman alphabet, we just have 26. So what we'll do is we'll just get the modulo 26, so the rest with the integer division of uh, 44 by 26, and it's uh, 18 because 44 is just 26 plus 18. So the 80th, 18th uh, letter in the alphabet is R, so we'll associate R. And we do that for all of the letters. And so with our message and our key, we have like the encrypted message. And the way to decrypt the message is just doing the same in reverse. So you take the X, you take the index in the alphabet, and since you have the key, you can subtract to the index, uh, the index of K, and it will be the index of the original letter. So yeah, it's a cool cipher, and uh, it's interesting to, to implement. So yeah, let's do that. Now we know how it works. We're going to just write Python functions uh, for that.
Okay, so going back to our trusty little uh, terminal here, we're gonna write our scripts. So, uh, the first step uh, is to write a script that has two functions, which will be encrypt letter and decrypt letter for both the encryption of the letter and the decryption of the letter. So let's do that. Uh, we'll call it useful functions.py. Also, what I should uh, mention is that uh, to get the index of the letters in the alphabet, the good thing is that we won't have to like compute it ourselves uh, and we won't have to like have an array with like, oh, A is one, etc. We have Python functions to do that automatically, but with a slight difference that they use the index in the ASCII table. So as you know, uh, computers are able to show way more characters than just the 26 letter of the alphabet. You have like all kinds of uh, fancy characters uh, that you can write. So it takes way more space than just 26. But the, yeah, the two functions that we'll use is ORD, which for a letter will give you the, in the ASCII index of the letter and CHR, which for a number will give you the ASCII character of uh, that index. Okay, let's do, uh, let's define the encrypt letter function that takes as an argument a letter and a key. So first, we want to get both index. So as I say, it's using the old function and it's a native Python function. So we don't have to import it. We don't have to define it. This comes like, it's like the name a variable that comes in every script. It's always there uh, to use. So yeah. Uh, key index same and new index is sum of both but actually so here we want to do as for the, it's, there is still a finite number of ASCII characters. So we're gonna do the module operation with the number of ASCII characters, which is, I don't know it by heart, but I have it here, which is this number. And we'll return the character of this new index. Okay. So that's for our encrypt letter function. Now we'll do the decrypt letter function. And we'll basically do the same, but with a minus sign instead of a plus sign. So now we're here, we also want to test our functions to make sure that uh, they function and the easy test E2 is to encrypt and decrypt a letter with the same key and see if we go back to the same value. So we'll put a comment saying test and we'll do test letter equals, let's say L decrypted letter is decrypt letter of encrypt letter of test letter. Okay. And the test will be uh, if test letter is the same as the decrypted letter, 
then we print test fast else we'll print test failed okay so we save this file okay and now let's run it ha of course uh, 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 I forgot to put a key in my test uh, so test key will be uh, h and here test key and also with the second one Oh yeah, lied to you, it's not car, it's CHR. And you see it changes color because now it recognizes it's a function that exists. Otherwise it just, was just something I made up. Yay, test passed. So we have our first two functions that uh, work properly. And then uh, we'll do the third function which will be, uh, and actually is that this is quite ugly, so I'm gonna just make it a little bit more prettier, like that. Okay. So now we are gonna do our third uh, function, which will be uh, process message. This one will take a whole message, so with multiple letters, and a whole key with multiple letters too, and an argument which will be either are we decrypting or encrypting the message. So the argument will be encrypt because it will be a boolean if it's true we encrypt, if not, it's the only other thing we can do is decrypting. So let's do that. So we'll start initializing our process message with an empty string. So then we'll be choosing a function based on the encrypt message. So process letter will be encrypt letter if encrypt else decrypt letter. So this is an inline if. So the way to read that is this is uh, a variable, I will assign it this value if this is true, and this is a boolean that we put here, else otherwise I give it the decrypt letter value. So this is either equal to that or that, and the first one if this is true, and the second one if this is false. And by the way, uh, in Python, everything is an object. So functions are also objects. So it's totally okay to assign to a variable a function here, as we, as we are doing. Okay, and now uh, for i and letter in enumerate message. So here I'm using the enumerate function, which is also a default function that already exists. We don't have to import it or define it. And the way it works is that um, when you iterate over, so here it will be a string. So if I do four letter in message, I will get like each 
different character of the message. But the enumerate, it just adds, it returns both the letter and the index of the letter in the in the message. So if, if you do, if you use enumerate, you can use it in list or uh, in anything. It's just that when you iterate over something, it will both return to you the index and the object uh, on which you're iterating, well, the, the element in the object you're iterating over. So it's, e it's easier to grab just the object and the index at the same time. Okay, so the key letter will be the key at index i, but since the key might be smaller than the message, we need to actually use percent of length the key. So here, this expression means the key letter is, is the element number i of key, actually not number i, but number i percent length of key. So it's just to wrap around uh, the same one. So if we if i is superior to the length of key and we don't put that, we would get an error because it would say, oh yeah, no index error. You, you're trying to get I don't know, the tenth element of key, but key only has nine elements, so it doesn't work. So then is a percentage means that if you, we go above the length of key, it's just a rest past the division of length of key. So if, if length of key is 10 and we ask, or is nine and we'll ask for the 10th one, it will just uh, give us the first one. So yeah, we have our key. Uh, now the process key will be, Uh, the function process letter applied to letter and the key letter. And now we'll just add the process key to the process message. So processed message plus equal process. So the plus equals means it's equivalent to doing processed message equals processed message plus processed key. Uh, it's just to avoid to have to write processed message twice. Okay. And then we return the process message. And again, we can test it. We'll say test message is message test key is key encrypted message is process message of message key encrypt equals true. And then decrypted message will be same thing, oh, no. process and not processed, but here processed, here processed message, yeah, the same key, but encrypt will be false. Okay, and again we will test so yeah, I should add here first first so that we can differ differentiate our two tests. Then if 
uh, decrypted message of course equals this message print uh, second test pass else print second test failed okay so we save that and now I have an error in my script because message is not defined of here because it was test message and not just message. So it's uh, here. So now I save this version. And now key is not defined because of course it's not key. It is test key, but actually, yeah. Uh, so now it's ugly because it's going off the border, so. Okay, so now it's prettier. Okay, and now <laughs> process message is not defined. And uh, where is it? Uh, because it's not process message, it's encrypted message. Yes. Mm-hmm. And now string object is not callable. Oh yeah. Else I put decrypted letter, but actually it should be encrypt letter because it's function and not the um, object of the decrypted letter. Yay! So now both tests passed. So yeah, we are doing great. Yay! But now uh, we want to make a script to call uh, those functions on files. We'll create a cipher script uh, file. Okay. And in this one, we'll import a function from the previous one. Useful functions import process message. And in this one, um, so actually what we wanted to do, it's we want, uh, we don't want to have to write the message uh, directly in the command line. So we'll make it take a file as an input. And so that uh, will be also for you a good example of how to like open a file and read data from it. Also, we'll want to import arc parse so that we can give as a, so we'll give two arguments to our script. First, the pass to the message file um, because the message could be very long. The key will keep it as just a string that we pass along the command line. And the third argument will be, uh, are we decrypting or are we encrypting? Uh, yes. So 
And this script will gonna make it, uh, so it's a bit of, a, of an overkill here because it will do only that, but I wanna show you how, uh, like the proper way or um, how scripts uh, are done. So what we're gonna do is define a main function that will take, as I said, a uh, message pass key and encrypt well actually no the, so the third one won't be a boolean it will be the mode which will be encryption or decryption okay we will first uh, load the file so the way i suggest to do is the with uh, context uh, operator so we'll do with open message pass. So the R here is just to say we are reading the file. We are not writing to it. So it's a safe way to open the file. And it's, we will open it as message file. Okay, so now what's up with this wheeze? So the idea of wheeze, it's um, to generate a context so it's like a if or for, uh, it means that when you put a with, then at the end you put a column. Afterwards, you have to indent uh, four spaces, uh, your, your code, and the code that will be indented will know the message file as this opened. And the idea is uh, as soon as you break the indentation and you go back to the original indentation here, it will close the file automatically. So it's a handy way of uh, managing files because then it will do the closing automatically. The alternative, so yeah, let's say here we do stuff with message file and then do other stuff. So here, we know what the message file here, and then when we come back here, the message file is closed and we do other stuff. The alternative way of doing that would be message file equals open the message pass as reading, and then do stuff with file and then message file.close then do other stuff so the reason this is better than this the first one is that we have one less line of code <laughs> it's not a big reason but it's yeah it's always good to have less code to write but the main reason is also if something goes wrong here you can have your code that crashes without closing your file. And if you're just reading the file, it's, it's okay. You won't mess up a file just by reading it. But if we would have opened it in the right mode, so writing it, like cutting the connection with the file that's open as writable and not properly closed can mess up with the file. And in the, on the other way, if, if here, even if it's, it would have been like right, if we do stuff here and something crashes here, actually Python itself will know we are exiting the, the indentation, the context, and will close the file despite the fact that the rest is crashing. So it's the benefit of letting Python closing the file because it will catch other situation. Here, it will only close the file if it runs this line, but if something here happens and prevent it to go through, through this line, to this line, it will never properly close the file. But here, Python will, will know that whatever happens, as soon as you leave those, this context by any mean, you will close the file. So it's the safer and preferred way of interacting with, with files. Okay. Okay, but what stuff do we want to do here? We want the message to 
to be sets file dot read. Okay. And as soon as we have extracted the message from the file, we no longer need this because we only, we only work with the message. So we can go back to this indent indentation point. So now we have a message and now we'll check if uh, encrypt. So encrypt boolean will be uh, mode equals equals encryption. Because we need a boolean for our, our function, but I wanted this to be either the string encryption or the screen decryption just to show you more I will show you more stuff with the argument parser later on. So actually, we want also another argument because we want to write the process message in an output file. So we need an output pass here. And maybe we can call that input pass. OK, so yeah, we read from our input pass. We process the message. Message key encrypt. And then we will save our process message in a new file. So we open output pass and this time W for write because we are in writing mode as out file and then we will do out file dot write processed message yes this one so that's our main function and now we are going to do the if famous if name equals equals main. And so we've defined a main function. Now, if we are running this script as a main, what we want to do two things. We want to get the arguments with the arg parser and call this function. So let's do that. Create a parser, which is arg argument parser parser dot add argument so now we'll add an argument so the first one is the input pass so we'll do dash i so that it's short and uh, what we can do is give it a destination so it will it will be the name of the attribute of the args objects that we, you will see but basically it will be the name of the variable that we'll use so we'll say its destination is input pass uh, the type is a string maybe I can make it prettier so it doesn't go outside of my screen. Um, we'll, said, we'll say that it's required because you will have to provide it. If you try to call the script without specifying an input pass, it will say, oh no, I need this one. I cannot run with this. And uh, finally, a help message, which will say pass to the input file. OK, so that's one. The second one, since I'm lazy, I'm just going to copy it. Uh, it will just be an O because it will be output pass. The rest is all the same. Actually, I can also copy and maybe add a K for the key. Required. 
and help will say and the last thing we oh yeah it's the mode so dash m mode and this one so it was to show this uh, you can add you can add choices encryption decryption and you can say whether to encrypt or decrypt message okay so now we have all of our arguments our four arguments defined in our argument parser so we can get them by parsing the argument parse args args i said so yeah we get the arguments and we can call main args dot input pass args dot key args dot mode args dot output pass so yeah this should work so now let's make a test file so i'll make a message that txt file uh, that says hello i'm secret message so now we're gonna call safer script and so first oh i forgot what are the arguments i should put because it was so long ago so if i do help i have an error a syntax error <laughs> okay line 43 uh, 43 oh yeah because I forgot at the end the comma uh, between the different arguments now if I do help I have a nice message saying usage you can use cipher script with dash i input pass dash o output pass k key m and encryption or decryption and it says for each one, so help is just showing this message. I uh, is pass to the input file, pass to the output file, key, and like whether to encrypt or decrypt the message. But you notice something else. We have our, our tests here. And yeah, indeed, because it was made on purpose, because uh, maybe you noticed it, uh, but in our useful uh, function script, we didn't uh, put the if name equals main and indeed in our cipher script we import from it so it means each time we import from it it will run everything including our tests but that's not what we want we want to run our tests just once when we call the useful function script but not each time and we'll have always uh, the print uh, that show up and it will be annoying so Let's go to the useful functions. And here are tests. We only want to do them if we are in the if name equals main. So I select everything and I will indent it by four spaces. So you see now it's all in the if statement. Save that and now if I do again the Python cipher script dash dash help, I don't have uh, the test prints here because it didn't run the test. So yeah, uh, we are almost done. Let's just test our script on our message. So now that we know what we want, need to do, I add the message text as an input. As an output, I'll say enc 
message.txt. The key will be my secret key. And the M will be encryption. Now, if I ls, I do have an enc message uh, file that appeared in my folder. So let's look at what in, what's inside. And it's <laughs> utter gibberish, but that's uh, what we wanted because it's just other ASCII characters that are not the one we wanted from the beginning. And now let's see if we can recover our initial message from that. Uh, so now it will be decryption. It will be, this will be the input. The output will be tech message. And I keep the same key because of course you need to, the same key, uh, it's the same. Uh -huh. And decryption, oh yeah. <laughs> So I see here, because I made a typo, of course, with 2C, okay, that's okay. Now, we indeed have a deck message text file. So let's check it. Yay! You have the recovered the su super secret message. So yeah, that's it uh, for this uh, tutorial. So now uh, you know about uh, scripts and functions and hopefully with this uh, fun example you had fun and uh, yeah you are now a bit more comfortable and uh, yeah that's it. So on the page of the exercise there is a, a command to get an actual text file with an encrypted uh, message to check that you've done everything correctly. So you can uh, copy paste the, the command. So it's wget, so it's a command to download things from uh, your terminal and you give it a URL to a file and it will get a file. So here it's a message encrypted.txt. So if you do that, it should like download it and have it here. And I'll leave, it, I'll leave you uh, decipher it with a key which would will be uh, the key will be my super secret key and uh, yeah i'll leave you the surprise of uh, checking what's actually uh in the as a decrypted message so yeah hope you had fun and that you learned some things about python scripts